Gresham College presents Empire, Exploitation and Resistance by Professor Richard J. Evans, FBA. Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this fifth and series of six lectures on empire. When I uh, reach the 20th century, my look at European empires uh, across the board from start to start to finish. Uh, you'll recall, if you came to the previous lecture, that uh, uh, previous two lectures, that the British domination of uh, the world, the British Empire, was based on free trade, which was to the advantage of the British since they controlled the seas and had a head start on other countries in terms of industrialisation and economic productivity. But in 1879, with uh, German Chancellor Bismarck's introduction of German import duties, the world of free trade began to uh, disappear, come to an end. And over the next, up to the next few years, up to the First World War, there are increasingly intensive debates in many countries about the introduction of import tariffs, import duties, uh, protectionism. This is to reach a height between the wars. In 1889, a world anti-slavery conference gave King Leopold of the Belgians permission to levy import duties in the Belgian Congo in order to pay for the elaborate infrastructure of roads, railways, steamboats, military posts, which he claimed he needed to bring slavery and the slave trade to an end in this huge region of Central Africa, which was, in effect, his private domain. Seduced by the promise of acquiring the territory for the state on his death, and by the prospect of profits from economic enterprise there, the Belgian parliament advanced him an enormous loan with which to begin the work. And Leopold was always strapped for cash, as a result of the ostentatious, expensive ceremony and display with which he tried to compensate for his extremely limited powers as a constitutional monarch in Belgium. Indeed, his whole Congolese enterprise was to some extent also a kind of compensatory uh, activity. And he saw in the Congo, above all, the opportunity for quick returns and fat profits. Slavery, in the end, really was just uh, a fig leaf to cover a very different kind of activity. He wasn't really concerned with the abolition of slavery or combating the slave trade. He was concerned with making money. And it began with ivory. His agents sallied forth into the territory, shooting elephants and buying up or seizing ivory from traders. This is a contemporary shot of the Congo River with uh, some ivory specimens being displayed. A Belgian senator <coughs> travelling through the Congo in 1896 reported constantly encountering long files of African porters, quote, black, miserable, with only a horribly filthy loincloth for clothing, Frisian bare head supporting the load, box, bale, ivory tusk, most of them sickly, drooping under a burden increased by tiredness and insufficient food. They come and go, he wrote, like, uh, like this, by the thousands, requisitioned by the state, armed with its powerful militias, handed over by chiefs whose slaves they are and who make off with their wages. Discipline on local populations was enforced <coughs> by beatings with a hippopotamus hide whip, the chicot, in, seen here in a photograph from uh, 1908. One Belgian magistrate in Leopoldville came across, uh, th that's of course the town in the Congo named after the king, came across 30 small children being mercilessly flogged on the orders of a white man because some of them had laughed at him when they saw him. To enforce control, <coughs> Leopold used a private army, the Force Publique, which by the turn of the century numbered 19,000 men and consumed half the entire budget for the colony. But the pattern of conquest was similar to the ones I've described elsewhere, 
involving a considerable degree of violence with local and regional African chiefs and rulers resisting the encroachments of Leopold's men and provoking violent reprisals. In Katanga, notoriously a clash with members of the Sangha people led to their chief and his men taking refuge in a large cave outside which the force publique then lit fires asphyxiating 178 men inside. And from 1892 to 1894, the force publique fought a prolonged war with an army of 10,000 led by Zanzibari merchants and, as uh, Leopold insisted, slave trader Tipu Tip and his son Sefu for control, in fact, of the ivory trade. Here's Tipu Tip looking uh, relatively benign and harmless in this uh, contemporary photograph. The Arab strongholds were razed to the ground by the force publique, and the whole effort of this uh, succeeded in reorienting the ivory trade from uh, the east, where Tipu Tip had been taking it all to, to uh, East Africa, uh, to the west through the Congo uh, instead. Here's the uh, contemporary illustration of the final assault on, uh, on, one of the, on the Arab stronghold. It wasn't the conquest of the Congo that marked out the Belgian colony from others. Uh, however, as you've seen in previous lectures, this is fairly common, uh, which wherever you care to look in the history of European imperialism, but the way it was run. A worldwide boom in rubber began simultaneously in the 1890s. It's the spread of the pneumatic tyre for uh, motor vehicles and for bicycles. It's uh, hoses for gardens and other purposes. It's insulation for electrical, tele telephone, telegraph wires, uh, many more things besides. It's an enormous boom in demand for rubber. And Leopold was prompted here to devote frantic efforts to harvest the wild rubber that grew in profusion in the Congo before cultivated rubber trees in Latin America and Asia reached maturity and undercut the prices he got for the wild variety. Profits for Leopold's company and other concessionaries reached more than 700% as prices multiplied 30-fold and Congo rubber earnings increased nearly 100-fold between 1890 and 1904 alone. Workers, effectively slave laborers, were sent out into the forest to cut the rubber vines that uh, grew often many meters up into the canopy, collecting the sap, but often uh, hacking them to bits and destroying the, uh, the plants as well. Here's a Congolese uh, rubber worker at the, uh, the turn of the last century, about 1900. Uh, this is the kind of plant that they, they were uh, tapping. Uh, and because they destroyed the plants, they had to go ever deeper into the forest to find undisturbed vines. So this is difficult and dangerous work. Belgian officers forced men to undertake it by taking their families hostage until the right amount of rubber <clears throat> was delivered. Tens of thousands of men carried the heavy solidified sap to collecting depots under the close supervision of the force publique. If the quantity was under the quota, then the hostages were shot, the women raped and killed. If a village resisted the labor conscription and hostage taking, African troops under white command shot everyone, and then to prove to their officers that the bullets had not been wasted on hunting expeditions, they severed the right hands of the victims, smoking them over a slow fire to preserve them on the way back to the depot. Often these atrocities were carried out by militias hired by concessionaries such as the ABIR, the Anglo-Belgian India Rubber Company. Uh, here we have uh, the uh, British missionaries who disapproved thoroughly of this uh, practice with men holding hands severed from victims in Bolenga and uh, Lingano by ABIR militiamen in 1904. One traveller reaching a village in an area where resistance was strong noted 81, counted 81 hands being smoked on a slow fire. See, he was told by one of the militiamen, see, here's our evidence. I always have to cut off the right hands of those we kill in order to show the state how many we've killed. 
And if the number of hands was insufficient to match the number of spent cartridges, soldiers simply cut the hands off living human beings to make up the quota. Well, these atrocities soon reached the notice of critics of colonialism in Europe and the USA. They were fed with information by the young E.D. Morrell, a clerk in a shipping company trading with the Congo, who had made contacts with missionaries in the area who were horrified by Leopold's cruelties. And Morrell subsequently became a leading uh, pacifist before and during the First World War. All these, uh, uh, all these uh, um, uh, details were corroborated and added to by Roger Casement, a British consul in the Congo at the time. And as these men publicized the horrors, their cause was taken up by the writers Mark Twain and indeed by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, taking a break from writing Sherlock Holmes stories and involving himself in contemporary politics. It could almost be a Sherlock Holmes story, actually, if you look at the cover illustration, but in fact it's a serious indictment of Leopold and his crimes. A vigorous defence of Leopold's allegedly humanitarian rule by his friends and allies was met with a cascade of facts and figures, stories and reports proving the contrary case. Shootings and deaths from exhaustion and maltreatment among the workers caused tens of thousands of deaths, above all among Congolese men. But far worse in statistical terms, at least, was the fact that the rapid growth of trading activities in rubber and ivory from the mid-1890s, penetrating further into the interior and back and forth, carried diseases from the coast, such as smallpox and sleeping sickness, to areas from which they'd previously been absent. Populations weakened by hunger and overwork succumbed in large numbers. And the birth rate plummeted as women refused to have children, and men were taken away to work on the rubber forest, or on the 241-mile railway Leopold had built to transport his booty, a railway that never employed uh, 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 fewer than 60,000 men at any one time when it was being built, working under the most atrocious conditions. And all this rapidly reduced the labour force, until in 1924, the Belgian authorities were so concerned about the shortage of labour in the Congo that they ordered a census of the population. And when compared with the late 19th century estimates, it found the population of the Congo had fallen by 50% from 20 million to 10. And the outrage aroused by the Congo atrocities across the world reflected, I think, among other things, the skillful publicity uh, of the outcry raised by Leopold's critics. Here we've got uh, two contemporary cartoons. There's Leopold on the left uh, counting his cash uh, and in the top left an illustration of the cruelty with which he was said to obtain it. An even more uh, a dramatic cartoon on the right, Leopold is a kind of uh, rubber snake devouring, uh, strangling the inhabitants of the, the Congo. King, as a result of this uh, publicity, was forced to hand over control to the Belgian government in 1908. In fact, he died the following year. The state administrators began <coughs> to replace wild rubber collection with the planting of rubber trees, not before time. <coughs> but forced labour continued and became even more widespread with the discovery of copper, gold and tin. A report from the gold mines of Moto revealed in 1920 uh, that some, the number of lashes administered to refractory or erring workers totaled in that one year alone 26,579. Classic piece of bureaucratic precision about uh, atrocious uh, crime. Between 1911 and 1918, 5,000 workers died in the copper mines and smelting works of Katanga from industrial accidents. The campaign against the Belgian Congo did not touch the French Congo, where similar outrages took place, but there were many fewer rubber vines there, uh, outrages on a much smaller scale. Um, a study of one French trading post found that the fluctuations in rubber production coincided, co correlated statistically with the number of bullets used by company police between 1904 and 1907. 
One estimate put the population loss in the French Congolese rainforest at 50% as well, but this didn't attract a lot of attention. Uh, even the German genocide of the Herreros, which I've talked about in a previous lecture, went largely unnoticed by world public opinion. Belgium's a much easier target than France, Germany, or Britain, or the USA. Uh, USA, whose war in the Philippines at the turn of the century caused over 200,000 deaths. So Belgium's a, a weak, uh, small country. Uh, it's relatively easy to, to um, publicize and get support for criticisms of the atrocities. But, of course, the whole reputation of Belgium changed dramatically between 1914 and 1918. Belgium, with the invasion by the Germans in 1914, turned from a byword for cruelty and mass murder into the heroic victim of uh, German invasion and occupation, and the atrocities were largely forgotten. Uh, this is American, uh, these American posters uh, from the mid, mid, middle of the war, uh, symbolizing the rape of, of Belgium. But the First World War also brought about a dramatic, even revolutionary change in international relations. It was bound to uh, have an effect on colonial rule. Sickened by the mass slaughter on the battlefields, the suffering, the waste of human life at the center of Europe, the nations gathered at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 were determined that a new moral order would prevail. Diplomacy was to be open, a new League of Nations was to ensure fairness and decency and, and the settlement of disputes by peaceful negotiation in international relations. Each European nation was to have the right to determine its own future and to rule itself, the doctrine of national self-determination. A clause committing the nations to racial equality was introduced by the Japanese, who remember were on the Allied side in the First World War, and therefore among the victors. It was defeated by opposition from Britain and Australia, but it still won a majority of votes. And it did, I think, signal a among uh, an aspect of a new moral atmosphere bolstered by the redistribution of the German colonies to the other nations on the grounds that they'd been run with violence and cruelty. So uh, if uh, once the German colonies were distributed to, uh, to uh, uh, Britain, uh, South Africa, Belgium, so even Belgium and so on, uh, on the grounds that uh, the Germans had been very cruel in running them, this kind of committed the other powers to doing better uh, and to uh, actually running their own colonies in a more peaceful, more positive way. So there's all these different, uh, different um, influences with the peace settlement and the aftermath of the impact of the First World War created something of a new atmosphere in uh, the administration of the European colonies. And colonial administration began to shift unevenly uh, and patchily, but uh, definitely to shift uh, from direct exploitation and control to indirect rule of one kind or another. Now, I want to look, first of all, as an example of the French colonial empire. This is the second largest in the world after the British. Earlier in the 19th century, the French still believed in the civilizing mission, uh, or in other words, spreading the benefits of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity across the globe. But of course, the experience of colonization in the latter part of the 19th century, above all during and after the scramble for Africa, forced something of a retreat from this doctrine. Now, if you take an indigenous African kingdom like Dahomey, whose female soldiers uh, quickly, of course, dubbed the Dahomey Amazons, uh, and whose customs of mass human sacrifice on the death of a king to provide an army for him to take to the afterworld, uh, here's a rather dramatic contemporary illustration of this going on. Uh, all of this fascinated and horrified Europeans. And when Dahomey's kingdom was destroyed by the French, it was clear that its inhabitants could not be, according to the French anyway, turned into Frenchmen. It would just cost too much in money and lives. As Jules Armand's book, Domination and Colonization, concluded in 1910, it was necessary, he said, to better the lot of the Aborigine in all ways, but only in directions that are profitable to him, by letting him evolve in his own way, by indirect rule with the conservation of the institutions of the subject people. 
And this is a classic statement of the idea of indirect <coughs> rule. And of course, it's easier in some areas than it is in others. Uh, some areas like New Caledonia and the Pacific Islands, for example, the French almost completely destroyed previous political structures. Uh, in the African colonies where this could happen, uh, chiefs are appointed by the colonial government uh, rather than succeeding to their post by hereditary right, but they occupied some of the powers uh, previously exercised by, uh, by local rulers. Um, there's a major difference in the French and the British empires that the French didn't have self-governing colonies of settlement like Canada or Australia, the dominions. Um, uh, it, it's, it's very much an empire ruled from Paris, uh, and uh, only in Algeria, really, uh, is, uh, is, is it different. And there, the areas of European uh, settlement in the north are simply incorporated into France. They became part of France. Uh, otherwise, uh, indirect rule began to be introduced in the French colonial empire after 1918 to 19, but not really on the kind of dominion basis because there were no, apart from Algeria, there's no other substantial areas of European settlement. The Dutch Empire, which centred on Indonesia, is a very good example of indirect rule. The Dutch crown took over from the former Dutch East India Company at the beginning of the 19th century. A war of conquest from 1825 to 1830, uh, which 200,000 people are said to have died, including 8,000 Dutch troops, ended in the surrender of the leader of the anti-Dutch forces, uh, Prince Diponegoro. Here's a dramatic picture of the, of the surrender. Dutch colonialism rejected from the outset the idea of a civilizing mission. Where possible, it uh, used native regents or aristocrats, each governing a regency or a district of a former sultanate in the Dutch East Indies. And native states are often uh, preserved intact as protectorates. And uh, Indonesian law <coughs> continued to govern the affairs of Indonesians, though not of Europeans. Indonesia is under the control of a governor general answering to colonial ministry in Holland staffed by specialists. It's not part of the mainstream political system. And so through the 19th century, the governor general, in, fact, in, in, in effect, held the reins of power. But by, from 1916, he shared it with a legislative assembly in the colony, whose members he nominated. And for, by 1929, there were indirect elections with the electorate characteristically divided up into different racial groups of different rights. Uh, it only had an advisory function, it was clearly gaining an influence. Uh, this all reflected economic developments in the Dutch East Indies. Um, the uh, land seizures are relatively restricted in the Dutch East, East Indies, uh, but the so-called culture system under which villages and plantations had to deliver fixed and often excessive quotas of produce like coffee, tea, tobacco, rubber, or here, uh, cocoa, uh, and devote 20% of their land producing these cash crops to the government rather than food for themselves. Uh, this system in the mid-19th century led to widespread malnutrition, and after protests from Dutch liberals, it was brought to an end as early as 1870. The system had made the colonizers and Indonesian traders rich and the colony profitable, and this indeed is one factor which uh, impels the uh, neighbour of uh, the Dutch in Europe, Leopold II of the Belgians, uh, that empire could mean uh, money and profits. This culture system also produced a, its legacy also produced an Indonesian elite, increasingly taken into partnership by the Dutch, who allowed Indonesians entry into civil service and education, though in separate schools. And by the 1920s, Indirect rule here had become linked to colonial schemes of improvement, with roads and railways being built, strong state investment in a modern economic infrastructure. So here's, here's one model of colonial rule that, at least after 1870, avoided the worst excesses of economic exploitation. Well, indirect rule was a strategy adopted uh, by, mainly adopted by the Russian Empire in Central Asia. We often forget that Russia was a colonial power simply because uh, the Russians conquered uh, huge areas of the same land mass on which Russia was and didn't have to go overseas. But uh, this is basically another example of colonialism. So uh, during the, uh, between 1840 and 1870, 
uh, and above all in the 1860s, uh, Russian forces conquered huge areas of Central Asia and the Caucasus. Uh, strong states of the area farmed by the Uzbeks, such as Kiva, were subdued in a series of violent wars in, the main, in which the main towns, notably Samarkand, were taken by force. Here's the, uh, here's the, uh, uh, the Russian uh, uh, conquest of the, of the city. Uh, these states, because these were stable areas based on agriculture with strong state structures, and they were retained as protectorates uh, in a form of indirect rule, whereas the nomadic Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and Turkomans had no real central administration were run directly by a governor's general responsible to the Tsar. And conveniently, the village commune self-administration, uh, in which villages ran themselves, as it were, uh, was prevalent in European Russia after the emancipation of the serfs in 1861, could be extended where appropriate further east. The Tsar abolished feudal land tenure, creating large numbers of free peasants in areas like Turkmenistan. And other aspects of Russian society, products of the reform era of Tsar Alexander II, like the education system, uh, were, however, not extended to the conquered population. In 1912, in one district of Turkmenistan, where there was a survey done, 95% of Russian children attended primary schools, but only 2% of non-Russians. This, I think, also reflected a huge wave of emigration. When one thinks of migration in the 19th century as being mainly uh, the Irish and Europeans, uh, British and, and uh, Italians migrating to South America, North America, uh, South Africa, Canada, uh, and so on. Uh, but there's also a very large-scale migration going on eastwards from European Russia into the newly conquered territories. From the 1880s, above all. Uh, the, these areas are divided into two administrative regions in Central Asia. Uh, Turkmenistan, which has a Russian population of 6%, and the steppe, uh, which is about 40%. And uh, following the discovery of oil in Azerbaijan in the 1870s, and oil, of course, becomes, with, with uh, uh, um, uh, increasing mechanized transport, more and more important. Uh, Russian influx is unstoppable. Inequalities in the region grew, uh, though the prosperous elite who made money from the oil began to include Azeris as well as immigrants. And what united all of these areas, and I think entitles us to regard them as Russian colonies, is the fact they're non-European, they're conquered in the 18th and 19th centuries, they contained an overwhelmingly Muslim or, in Siberia, non-Christian native population. And the Russians treated indigenous peoples as inferior to the administrators and settlers who came from European Russia. And, of course, as communications improved, these settlers increased in number, uh, with millions moving east following the Trans-Siberian Railway as it pushed its way across the steppe, uh, begun in 1891, and completed uh, in 1916, you might say, the last serious, uh, the last major achievement of the Tsars before the uh, February Revolution of the following year. Uh, here are migrants leaving the main station um, in, uh, I think it's in Moscow, could be St. Petersburg, um, at least in European Russia, migrants uh, packing their bags all ready to go and make new settlements in Siberia. So traditionally, Siberia had been an area where colonies, where, where convicts had been taken to, but rather in parallel to Australia, uh, increasingly now in the, in the late 19th, early 20th century, Siberia was used for free settlement by free, free peasants. The enormous distances, the relative sparseness of the population in some areas, the nomadic character of many tribes made Russian rule uh, difficult to impose directly. And where there were indigenous administrative structures, the Russians grasped eagerly for a system of indirect rule. But it's above all in Britain that indirect rule became a guiding principle of empire. Now, the leading advocate of indirect rule was Frederick Lord Lugard, governor of Nigeria from 1912 to 1919. Lugard recognized the impossibility of imposing direct rule on the powerful northern Muslim emirates in Nigeria, such as Kano. Here, for example, is the, emperor, the, uh, the emir with his cavalry, a formidable-looking force, uh, in 1911, in a photograph 
So Lugard opted for leading an administration, including finance and the law, to what he called native authorities, so long as part of the tax revenues they collected were sent to the colonial treasury. They were to be supervised by British authorities who retained control over foreign affairs, and they had to agree to obey laws and regulations as they were issued by the colonial British government. And in this way, Lugard thought the disadvantages of weak indirect rule, leaving too much to uh, what he called native authorities, uh, would be avoided, but also what he regarded as the abuses of native administration would be curbed by, uh, by, by passing laws where necessary. Uh, but also um, the harshness of direct rule, which destroyed native institutions and weakened indigenous social cohesion, would be avoided as well by leaving a lot of the basic laws, customs, and structures intact. Lugard called this system the dual mandate, to quote the title of the book he published in 1922 after he retired. There's no doubt about who is in control, as this photograph of Lugard's arrival in Calabar in 1912 shows. Uh, Double pomp and ceremony, uh, pomp and circumstance. Uh, here he comes, uh, arriving in Calabar by boat. Uh, but uh, that control could be exercised indirectly to everybody's benefit. Well, Lugard's ideas had a, a wide appeal to British politicians and colonial administrators between the wars. They fitted in well with the new humanitarian approach to international relations that came to the fore after the destruction of the First World War. They promised an avoidance of the colonial violence and excesses that aroused so much controversy above all in the Belgian case before 1914. They recognized the influence of new ideas in anthropology that stressed the validity of non-European modes of thought and behavior and began to challenge the racist idea that non-Europeans were unfit to govern themselves. And above all, they saved money. Very important in the straightened economic circumstances of the post-First World War era. Under Lugard's system, the financial burden of daily administration fell on the indigenous institutions rather than on the British colonial power. Lugard's doctrine provided the template for British administration in Africa between the wars. Now, in fact, of course, <coughs> very few areas were as well supplied <coughs> with effective indigenous administrative structures as northern Nigeria, where Lugard involved, evolved this doctrine. But this problem was solved by creating or appointing chiefs and so-called native councils, as for example in Eastern Central Africa. Often, as in this afraid rather faded photo, uh, they taken in 1922, the function of these chiefs in uh, administering the British Empire at a local level was recognized by titles and awards of various kinds. Similarly, in the French Empire, indigenous institutions were even reconstructed where they'd been destroyed. So the nominal authority of the Bay was preserved in Tunisia, Sultan in Morocco. Native mandarins were now used as part of the French administration in Indochina, as seen here in a photo from Hanoi in 1915. These are native mandarins, but they're also functionaries of the French, uh, French indirect rule. And this new principle of, new, of indirect rule, of course, of course, is not, in fact, so terribly new. It's just more widespread. It can be seen, above all, in the long history of British control over India. On the face of it, this was perhaps less than obvious. India is different to all the other colonies in the British Empire. In fact, there's no other colony like India in any European empire. It's very big. The population's already about 200 million in the 1860s. And it had previously been ruled by another great power, the Mughal Empire, which in some respects provided a ready-made infrastructure of rule to which the British claimed to be the successor, as justifying Disraeli's proclamation of Queen Victoria as Empress of India. 
India was not suitable for mass immigration and settlement like Canada or to some extent South Africa. Christian missions did not achieve very much in a land dominated by great institutional religions like Islam and Hinduism. The assimilation of 200 million Indians into British culture was an impossible ideal. After the 1857 rebellion, the dissolution of the East India Company and the takeover of the administration of India by the British state, it was ruled pretty autocratically by an appointed governor general. His powers limited only by a small council of civil servants. Now, over time, this council was expanded. In 1909, it was enlarged to include elected members. But it had no power to introduce laws or stop whatever the general, governor general happened to be doing. It only came in 1921. And provinces were gradually created too, also with councils, but also with limited powers until 1921. So it's a very kind of autocratic uh, system, at least till the First World War. British, but, but it, this was tempered in a number of different ways. I mean, on the face of it, it looks as if this is not indirect rule at all. But of course, it's more complicated than that. First of all, uh, there are, uh, there's the civil service, the first of the two major institutions on which British rule in India rested. This is a central elite organization operating across the entire country. It's staffed by British men, with only 5% of the posts occupied by Indians as late as 1915. Only in 1922 <clears throat> were the entrance examinations set in India as well as in Britain. So if you wanted to enter the uh, Indian civil service near India, you had to travel all the way to Britain to set the exams until then. By 1935, as a result of this change, a third of the service was staffed by Indians. The Indian Civil Service is well paid in the light of the corruption scandals uh, of the uh, late 18th century. It was relatively honest and conscientious. It collected the taxes already levied previously by the Mughals, above all, the land tax, which under the Mughal Empire had been administered by officials known as zamindars, effectively kind of high, high aristocrats. It administered justice under a codified system begun in 1861 that mixed British and Hindu principles and customs. And it provided political advisors to the 600 or so mostly small princely states that survived the mutiny, uh, not least because uh, the move to assimilate these states into British rule was thought to have been one of the causes of the 1857 rebellion. So uh, British rule in India might have been administered by the run fairly autocratically by the governor general, but there's a large number of princely states covering a large part of the, of the population uh, before, before that. If you can look at this, uh, you can see British India is a kind of pale pink bit, and the darker orangey bits are the, these uh, Indian states and territories, which are ruled nominally by Indian princes, Maharajas, um, Nawabs, and so on, uh, but steered from behind by British advisers. These princely states collected their own taxes, ran their own affairs, uh, but of course under the advice of British officials, who often encouraged change and modernization. And over time, the growing habit of educating the younger generation of princes at British public schools and at universities, as well as the intensification of communications through better transport, telegraph, telephone, and so on, railway, uh, the uh, increasing employment of British or British trained civil servants uh, to administer these states. These princely states developed an amalgam of Indian traditions and European modernity that struck many as an ideal example of what could be achieved by uh, indirect rule. Here's one Majaraja, I've forgotten who it is, but it's a very characteristic uh, portrait from the late 19th century. Very often, Maharajas were given British knighthoods uh, as a recognition of their, of their status and their function. But not just in these princely states, also in the areas under direct rule, British control depended effectively on the cooperation of Indians, both elites and the masses. And this is achieved above all by the retention of Indian customs, institutions and basic structures of administration, 
along with sufficient reforms to provide good and honest government. And the full panoply of modern Victorian administration is applied to India with the founding of educational institutions like the University of Madras in 1857, the adoption of the principle put forward in Macaulay's 1835 report on Indian education that schools and colleges teaching in English should be used to create a new Indian administrative elite that could act as an intermediary between British and Indian society. Police forces are created from the 1860s, unified in 1905. Free trade uh, through much of the 19th century and back into the 18th century is used to destroy autonomous uh, domestic industries like textiles early on. But India's incorporation into a rapidly globalizing world economy stimulated new industries, which led to an increasing rate of urbanization, helped by the construction of roads, railways, and canals. And the shock, in other words, the shock of the 1857 rebellion stimulated the British to be cautious and conservative in their handling of Indian society and Indian traditions, and to engage in a sustained policy of improvement and development to convince Indians of the benefits of British rule. It's kind of one step um, away from uh, the effects I described in an earlier lecture of the Boxer Rebellion in China, which convinced European powers that it would be very unwise to attempt any further uh, political uh, penetration of, the, of, the Chinese, of Chinese society. Underpinning all of this, of course, is the application or the threat of force in the form of the second great institution of British rule in India, namely the Indian Army. Here's some Indian cavalry. Uh, going forth on an expedition. Strategically, the Indian army supplied what Britain, the world's largest sea power, so signally lacked, namely a really large regular land force. The British regular army numbered about a quarter of a million men, but it had to defend and garrison colonies all over the world. The Indian army numbered uh, more than 200,000 men after the changes introduced following the 1857 rebellion. It could be quickly expanded by calling up reserves. It was paid for by taxes levied in India and indeed consumed around a third of all Indian tax revenues. In the key area of the rebellion, Bengal, the proportion of European to Indian troops in the army was fixed at one to one. In Madras and Bombay, one to two, and altogether the 73,000 British and 154,000 Indian troops in the charge of British senior officers in 1885. British army regiments served in Indian rotation with sepoy, that's the Indian regiments, remaining separate. Recruits are taken from so-called martial areas like the Northwest Frontier, Nepal or the Punjab, uh, areas in fact which had largely stayed loyal in 1857, as well as from the poorest and most illiterate social groups who were seen as less likely to get ideas about rebellion and revolt. The Indian Army is an asset not just in ruling the subcontinent, but also in establishing British supremacy in South and Southeast Asia more generally, and in providing backing for the British acquisition of colonies in East Africa and the scramble for Africa, and above all in the First World War, where 800,000 Indian troops fought in the front line with nearly 50,000 killed or missing in action. Here's a, an Indian uh, platoon uh, putting on their gas masks, ready for, the, ready for the fray. But British rule in India brought problems too, of course. The intensive land taxes levied by the Raj and collected with considerably greater efficiency than their equivalents had been under the Mughals caused some changes in land use and turned bad harvests into famines, with two million dying of starvation in northern India in 1860 to 61, six million across India in the 1870s, and another five million when the monsoon failed in 1896 to 97. Here's a contemporary drawing of Indians queuing at a food station during the, uh, during the, uh, the famine of 1896 to 7. And the situation is made worse in that one by an outbreak of plague. Communications are still not good enough for effective relief operations to be mounted, uh, although the organization of relief was also uh, very rudimentary. 
As late as 1921, only 3% of Indians had any formal education, making disease prevention difficult. Reading and writing are the prerogative of only a small elite. It's only from the 1890s, too, that the germ theory of disease began to influence British public health authorities in developing more effective disease prevention and control. India is also the major reservoir of indentured labour. It's a kind of modern quasi-slavery where workers are paid but are tied to contracts that deprive them of their freedom and rights. 60,000 South Asians, mostly Indians, were sent to Fiji to work between 1879 and 1920. 25,000 to Mauritius. 30,000 Indians built Kenya's railways in the 1890s. More than a third of them suffered injury or uh, uh, serious injury or death during the construction. Total number of South Asians, most of them Indians, working across the British Empire by 1900 as indentured labourers totaled more than a million. And many of them stayed on uh, and were augmented by others. By 1930, there were more than 600,000 Indians living in Malaya, for example. Well, I think this, the spread of Indian labour across the British Empire in, indicated its global nature, I think. But of course, also caused disruption to Indian communities on the subcontinent, and to the Indian economy, and led to racial tensions in some colonies, notably in Fiji, of two Indian indentured, indentured labourers in this little photograph arriving in, in Fiji and they've caused, uh, there have been racial tensions up to until very recently. And then also uh, another problem in India itself, uh, the British tended to favour Hindus over Muslims and educational administrative policies began to solidify rival Hindu and Muslim elites jostling for position within the Raj uh, with terrible consequences uh, in the mid 20th century. Still, in India, and increasingly after 1918 in other parts of the British Empire, modernisation was seen as the best means of bringing stability and order to colonial societies. Conquest was followed, in the end, by development. This could be uh, complicated. It could have all kinds of, uh, different, take all kinds of different paths. Uh, and just to illustrate this, uh, I want to turn to the example of, of Burma. Uh, now, the Kingdom of Upper Burma, uh, fear of growing French power in Indochina and the possible advantage this would give the French in building commercial relations with China, prompted serious British concern when the death of the King of Upper Burma in 1878 sparked a struggle for its accession, in the course of which majority of his 110 children were brutally slaughtered by being strangled and then trampled by, by elephants. It was, uh, wrong, it was taboo to spill royal blood, so they couldn't actually be knifed. The victor, King Tibor, uh, he is looking uh, suitably fierce uh, and martial with a sword in his hand, um, was not disposed to yield to the British. And, but uh, interestingly, it wasn't actually disapproval. This is the, the excuse used for the invasion. But it wasn't really disapproval of this violence. It was rather the concern that he now began to ne open negotiations with the French, who agreed to build a railway in Burma and open a bank. And this led, after a seven-year gap, to the British declaring that uh, the country had descended into chaos and sending in 10,000 troops in 1885. The British defeated the Burmese forces and proclaimed the annexation of Upper Burma in 1886 at the end of what became known as the Third Anglo-Burmese War. And here's some of the destruction uh, and, and death that it uh, involved in this contemporary photograph. Third Anglo-Burmese War was denounced by liberal MPs as, quote, an act of high-handed violence, an act of flagrant folly, through which they argued the Burmese political system had been destroyed, leaving chaos behind. Guerrilla resistance proliferated, led by some of the remaining princes who survived the slaughter, and soon the British had 40,000 troops in the country engaging in a pacification campaign in inverted commas that involved the frequent execution of dacoits or rebels and the burning of their villages. And by 1890, peace had descended to last up to the 1940s. It was another typical example of colonial conquest. Law and order had been brought to Burma. 
The Burman, remarked one British civil servant in the governor's office, was a happy-go-lucky sort of chap, the Irishman of the East. He needed keeping in order like the Irish did. As another commentator declared, if riches and personal comfort, protection of property, just laws, incorruptible judges and rulers are blessings as a set-off against utopian dreams of freedom, then Jack Berman has a happy future. But what this meant in practice, however, is something very different. It's the wholesale commercial, uh, uh, conversion of the countryside to commercial rice production. So huge tracts of forest are felled. British farmers, uh, firms, companies brought in thousands of indentured laborers from India to do the work. Uh, there are um, uh, mass expropriations, uh, usually through piling up debts uh, and then calling, uh, calling in the, the, the debts of um, uh, small farms. Um, this, uh, on the one hand, uh, was massively destructive of Burmese society, but on the other hand, it also meant improved communications, roads, railways, seaports, urban commercial development. The habit of British soldiers and administrators of taking Burmese women as their wives, or more usually concubines, much complained of in the 1890s, led gradually to the emergence of a new Anglo-Burmese elite, that dominated the administration of the country in the interwar years. And Burma, through these massive changes in the economy, became a really major source of rice supplies for large parts of the British Empire, above all to India, where it supplied 15% of rice consumed, and East Africa. So commercial interests, in the end, dominated after the conquest. He was one region where, where an indirect rule was initially not attempted, but Burma took a different route. But there's an imperial ideology of improvement too. And this is more general. It's summed up in 1899 in Kipling's famous poem, written in response, in fact, to the American conquest of the Philippines, when he exhorted Europeans to, quote, take up the white man's burden and send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild. Your new court, sullen peoples, half devil and half child. Take up the white man's burden, the savage wars of peace. Fill full the mouth of famine and bid the sickness cease. While well, cartoonists like this one, American one, were quick to pick up Kipling's message. Interpreted here as John Bull determinedly carrying a rather happy-looking collection of Indians, Zulus, Chinese, and Egyptians over the rocky paths of slavery, vice, cannibalism, cruelty, and ignorance, up the hill to the final goal of civilization. With Uncle Sam, sweating profusely and looking rather old and tired, following in his footsteps across barbarism and oppression, carrying a basket full of rather less happy-looking, more difficult-looking uh, collection of colonized Cubans, Hawaiians, and Filipinos uh, up the hill to civilization. And his apologies to, uh, to Kipling, the white man's, white man's burden. Um, the racism is very obvious, of course, in Kipling's poem. The, the references to uh, the colonized people as half devil and half child. Um, and also, of course, the interesting reference to savage wars of peace, by which he means these wars of conquest. In his case, it's the, uh, the American conquest of the Philippines, but it referring, of course, to other colonial wars of conquest as well. But Kipling and even the cartoon, however doubtful in its reference to uh, American intentions, you wonder if he's ever going to get to the top, um, uh, is, also has a commitment to improvement. To serve the growing economies and industrializing societies of the colonies, educated clerks and administrators were needed. And this in turn, whether it involved local education or um, education in Britain or another European metropolis, began to create elites that imbibe European notions of nationalism, democracy, and liberal values however much they might be adapted to local circumstances. And in some colonies, including Burma, uh, a sense of national identity predated colonization 
survived the destruction of indigenous political structures lasted all the way through. In others, it required the language of European liberalism to find an articulation. The model of European political parties in the age of mass democracy that began in the 1890s uh, uh, gave it uh, institutional uh, expression. So already 1885 saw the formation of the Indian National Congress, based at first rather oddly on the ideas of the Theosophical Movement founded by Madame Blavatsky, a Quasar religious organization which was, however, dedicated to world brotherhood. Uh, it uh, uh, was uh, non-racist. It involved uh, Englishmen and Indians. Uh, its aim was to exert pressure for in educated Indians to participate more in government administration. Soon, the Indian National Congress gained widespread support among the educated Indian elites and began to exert pressure that led the government to grant concessions, including the Indian Councils Act of 1892, allowing corporations to nominate educated Indians to legislative councils, in 1909, as I mentioned, to stand for election. In 1917, following the massive commitment of Indian troops to the Allied side in the First World War, you remember those Indian troops with gas masks on I showed, the British government announced, in effect, that India was to be set on the road to becoming dominion, like Canada or Australia. Based as the Secretary of State for India, Edwin Montagu, put it, on the gradual development of self-governing institutions with a view to the progressive realization of responsible government in India as an integral part of the British Empire. In 1919, limited administrative powers are passed to provincial councils. In 1935, full ministerial powers transferred to the provinces, the promise of transition to a federal system of government run by Indians. By this time, of course, the driving force uh, in the Congress was Mahatma Gandhi, a British-trained lawyer who had practiced in South Africa and returned to India uh, in 1915 to lead a com campaign of non-violent civil disobedience based, above all, on refusal to pay taxes, which he realized were causing major damage to the rural economy in many areas. Before long, Gandhi was demanding not just self-government and dominion status, but also independence for India. The conditions that allowed the British, the peculiar historical conditions that allowed the British to gain control over India, were now disappearing. The British had been able to, uh, in the 18th century, to take advantage of the breakup of the Mughal Empire and the ensuing disunity to uh, take over one Indian state after another or play them off against each other. But by uniting India themselves and binding it together with a unitary system of administration and communications, they created the possibility for a new united nationalist movement to emerge. That encouraged <clears throat> the growth of an educated elite. But this was imbued with European ideas of national self-determination, adapted, as Gandhi insisted, to Indian conditions. They had, on the other hand, <clears throat> fastened on to uh, traditional Indian institutions, from the land tax to the Maharajas and princely states, and to the new educated Indian elite, these are beginning to like seem, seem like obstacles to process, progress. It would take the Second World War before the fragility of British and more broadly European colonial rule became fully apparent. But the writing's already on the wall long before this, and not just in India. It's indeed possible uh, at the turn of the century to take an altogether different view of the white man's burden, one in which the imperialist was imposing a burden on the colonized and not the other way round. And here you can see uh, a procession in this, in this cartoon um, of uncles. This is again the American Congress of the Philippines, which is a turning point in America's consciousness that America had acquired, the United States had acquired an empire. And here you have Uncle Sam, followed by John Bull, followed by the Kaiser, uh, looks like a Frenchman trailing a little bit behind, uh, being carried uh, aloft by uh, groaning uh, uh, Africans, Indians. Once more, it's Kipling who gave expression at the moment, but this time, long in advance, in a poem, poem written under the overwhelming effect of the review of the Royal Navy, the largest fleet ever assembled, on Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897, a poem that ran directly counter to the mood of the time, but acquired something of a prophetic dimension in retrospect. Kipling's recessional. Far called, our navies melt away. On dune and headland sinks the fire. Lo, all our pomp of yesterdays 
is one with Nineveh and Tyre. Kipling reminded his readers of the transience of all empires, including ultimately the British Empire on which the sun never set. And in my sixth and final lecture in this series, on March 27th, I'll describe and analyze the fall of the European empires in the short period from the 1945 to the 1970s and try to come to a conclusion about how and why they rose and fell and what legacy they left to the world. Thank you very much. For more information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.